Movement. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask that you turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. While you're turning there, um, always pray for me as your pastor. Uh, let the Lord uh, uh, would be lifted up in what I preach. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, we're going to begin our reading in verse 12. Uh, Matthew chapter 4 in verse 12. Now when Jesus heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan of Galilee and of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them that sat in the region and the shadows of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Amen. So Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we give you great glory and honor for your word. Lord, as time progresses, we see how precious it is and how unfortunate uh, there are people out there today that don't have this book, that don't have the guidance by the word. And we pray for them that translation may take effect and that you would bring them the word of God. Uh, God, we pray that you would bless your word this morning, that you would be lifted up in what is preached. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now we'll be kind of looking at a number of things, but I want you to see the promise that the Lord God made to Andrew and Peter. He said, I will make you fishers of men. Now uh, that is uh, a promise. It is a task we should do. I think there was a couple of reasons that uh, he used this verbiage and one reason was that they understood it. They knew what a fisherman was about. They knew what uh, they knew what the goal of fishing was all about, and they understood that uh, very, very well. Now, I will say this as we're starting: just remember to be to catch fish, you have to be a good fisherman. And on top of that. The guidance of the Lord God has to put fish down there. If you cast a net, and we are not much about net fishing here in Tennessee, but if you cast a net, if there's no fish down there, it will do you no good. And you can't control where the fish is at. Only God does that. But we have to be faithful to cast the net. Back in verse 12, the Bible says, Now when Jesus heard that John was cast into prison, now, the reason that this is significant, really until John's ministry was over, Christ's ministry was not really going to begin because he was the predecessor, he was the prophet, and that's why he had a little issue with his mama when he, she said they have no wine because it's, and he says, my time has not yet come. And, and, and so I want you to see as well as that, in addition, there's a timing to ministry. You know, Ecclesiastes says very clearly there is a time for everything, and sometimes we push the door, and sometimes we stand still way too long. And what we should be in that is obedience. So we see the Lord Jesus Christ, the very best example we possibly can have, waited on God's timetable. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, I want you to see that all through his ministry, all through his life, even as a child, he went across to pinpoint areas to fulfill prophecy. And that was part of his ministry. If he had not made, and if you look, it was kind of a roundabout trip to get where he was going. But if he had not made that trip, 
prophecy would have made maintained, I mean remained unfulfilled, unfulfilled, and he wouldn't have met the mark. So he did this time and time again. Why? To illustrate who he was. To show that, yes, I am the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the very living Son of God. And show precisely that he fulfilled everything that was spoken about him. Uh, now, uh, that it might be fulfilled, which was, by, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying... The, uh, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan of Galilee of the Gentiles. And the people, which I believe would be the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them that were which sat in the region and the shadow of death, uh, of death, light is sprung up. Now, I want you to see the Gentiles are are made mention of here and how that we would see the light. And in the early years of my ministry, and I know it's kind of true uh, uh, with uh, Brother Jackson too, I felt it necessary that I make them see. Now, remember this, that is an impossibility. You cannot make other people see, but you can show them the picture. Now, are they going to respond to it? That's in the hands of God. But it's our responsibility to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ, to present His life and His work, and then whatever, He, he doeth what seemeth good unto Himself. And so I want you to see that the Lord worked on the timetable, even in the predicting that we would be included. And that's a marvelous thing. And He did that on His way uh, to Jerusalem. And from that time, Jesus began to preach, repent. Now, if that's a familiar sermon to you, uh, that it should be because that was the very beginning of John's ministry at well. A very simple message, repent. But what I have found in 27 years of preaching, it's easy to preach, but I've not seen much response to it. Uh, because repenting is acknowledging your sin and having godly sorrow of it. And that's a rarity in the modern day. Uh, you, you, don't see, you don't see that even among God's people. And so what seemed might be a, a simplistic message was a message that largely fell on deaf ears, that, that were not heard uh, with a spiritual ear by the bulk majority that heard it. And so we find... His, uh, his message was very simple and, and very easy to understand. And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee. Now, I love the picture here and how deliberate the Lord Jesus is in the places that he goes because he knew that Peter and Andrew were down there. He knew that he was going to call them and he knew that they would respond and he went in that direction. You know, I very, I very frequently praise the Lord that he came in my direction because I'll tell you this, I had no intention in going to his and uh, it wasn't in my ability to go to his. I was not capable of going to him and he came to me and you'll see that all all the time through the ministry of Christ. It works with Him coming to you and not the other way around. And, and so we find that the, the Lord Jesus made a special trip just down to the seashore for this to happen. Then He says in verse 19, He saith unto them, verse 18, we'll get that, And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, now, this word brethren does not mean brethren in Christ. They were true brothers. It's just like if you saw me and James, you could say there goes two brothers because we are tied genetically. Same mother, same father. We are brothers. These were not brethren yet. These were not Christian people yet. Uh, uh, if you and, and that's what we're going to do is follow the ministry of Peter and see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you know what? If you'll be real honest with yourself, you've had the good, bad, and ugly as well. See, uh, Peter wasn't picture perfect. Peter wasn't always the example that uh, we think that he ought to be. But then when we look at his life, I'd be willing to stand.
say that you failed Christ more than Peter did. But you know what? We don't want to acknowledge it, do we? We, we don't want to be honest about that part of our ministry. And, and so we find that Peter very, very much uh, uh, was not yet where he needed to be. Uh, I don't even think he was saved. But I want you to see he was called. And the redeeming factor, it says, and they followed him. Uh, you know, that's remarkable in the day in which we live, is it not? How many people do you know that really follow Christ? That if He gives them a calling, that they're willing to pick up the roots and go. That That's an unusual thing in the modern day. Now go to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8, and we begin to see some things that Peter beheld and that Peter experienced and that Peter saw. Now, I'll, I'll ask you, how many events in your life have you seen that you can attribute unto God and God alone? Now, if we would look with a spiritual eye, you would see it time and time and time again, but more times than not, we uh, attribute it to ourselves, or we attribute it to happenstance, and we attribute it to other things, but uh, time and time again through the ministry, Peter, the ministry of Christ, Peter saw things that could be attributed only into the power of Christ. Um, Matthew uh, chapter 8, verse 14. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, now the first thing I want you to see is that Peter lent his house to the service of God. Now, I made this statement, and I don't even know how young I was when the first time I heard my mama say it, but she said, as far as you can go is home. And there's a whole lot of truth in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're at home, that's your place. But have you given it to God? Uh, the Bible teaches us we should invite strangers in unaware. And <laughs> we live in a pretty... A pretty uncertain day to follow through with that, don't we? But is that a reason? Is that an excuse? You know, there's a big difference between a reason and an excuse, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A reason is something genuine and you can't get it accomplished. An excuse is something you say because you don't want to. And, and so we find that uh, Peter, being the man that he was, he had lent his house out, he'd give... Uh, he had said Christ can come in and, and no doubt they were making provision for him and making him ready. And then notice in verse 15, and when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. Now that's his mother-in-law. Now I don't know if that was for the benefit of Peter or for the condemnation of, the, of Peter, but he healed his mother-in-law. And uh, he got her going again. And, and it says that she raised up and that she began to minister unto the people there. You know what? That's an amazing thing. And if you see someone that, that sick and raised up, it ought to be a joyful thing. It ought to be a glad thing. And you know what? It, it had to get Peter's attention. Right? It, it had to be something that was remarkable to <clears> him. <throat> you know what? Uh, even before the Lord saved me, I saw some remarkable things uh, growing up in a very, very small community. And everyone knew everybody, and everyone knew everybody's problems. And I saw things time and time again where it could only be attributed to the Lord God. And you know, back in that day, they let people know about it. They wouldn't say, well, you know, we finally got a check come through. Uh, they'd say, God, God solved the problem. That, that we had no way out and God made us a way out. And time and time again, you would find them to do that. And I really believe that Peter, this caught his attention and he saw not only did the Lord Jesus have the power to accomplish it, but I think it's significant is that Peter's mother-in-law got up and began to work. You know, once you're saved, it is your responsibility to get up and work. We don't see much of that today, do we? That's why people that just lie around, oh yeah, I'm saved and never do a thing to the service of Christ, I have no confidence in them whatsoever. Right? 
uh, because uh, I just don't think it lines up with the scripture. And, and so we find that uh, this great miraculous event caught Peter's eye. And no doubt he took note of what was happening in Matthew chapter 10 in verse 2. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 2, uh, Peter gets a new ministry. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, which is called Peter. Now I've heard a lot of debate about um, uh, about the names and how they went and how they were changed and different things in the lives of the apostles. But I'm assuming Simon was his first name and Peter was his last name, just like my name is Larry Lafferty. But I do know that somewhere along the way, he went from Little Rock to Big Rock, <laughs> uh, to strong, to, to reliable. I've heard the first, sometimes it's reliable, uh, Almost like a pebble. And then he became, you know what strengthens you? Experience. What makes you stronger? Experience. When you see something come from nothing, you know that God has been there. And, and, and so we find that Peter is given this special ministry of the apostleship. Now, was he saved yet? I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't know when. I personally think that he was saved in 16. And that's just my own, own opinion. You can take it for what it's worth. All it is, it's an opinion. Because he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, you don't get that by attending church. You don't get that by simple <laughs> being raised in a Christian home. That is a revealed truth that only comes from the Almighty. And so we find... We find that uh, that Peter is given a new ministry. He had seen healings by this point. He had seen divine things. He had not seen the dead get raised to life yet, but he soon would. And, and he had seen the ability of Christ beyond what we could ever find him. You know, you know, one of my favorite things in the scripture, and I think it's at the end of Revelation, he says, and uh, if everything had been told in Christ's ministry, there's no book that could contain it. Mm. Have you ever thought that what we've got is just a minute amount? Yeah. That, that's amazing to me because I can't even get what we do have up here. Right. Much less what the stuff we've never even heard of. Right. That 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 that's that's un, that's un, just I can't make myself understand that. And so we see that a new ministry of Paul begins. I mean, excuse me, of Peter, and he starts his apostleship. Uh, Matthew fourteen, Matthew fourteen, in verse twenty-eight. Matthew uh, fourteen in verse twenty-eight. The Bible says this. And Peter answered and said, Lord. If it, be, if, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Now, uh, that don't seem like much, and we, we've all read and heard preaching on these events. But you know what? I believe Peter was extremely severe, I mean, sincere, when he made this statement. Now, I would be willing to say, and I like water. I like swimming. Uh, I grew up, I had to throw a rock almost from the porch and hit the creek. That's how close I was to water. And, uh, but I'm not too much on getting out there when it's capping. Me and Brother Ken was going to parish one day, and man, it was cold that day, to preach. And uh, we was going across the river, and Kenny said, what's that? And I said, what's what? And uh, the, the, river, uh, the river was tapping. I said, that's what we call tapping. I said, you don't want to be out there in that. And see, that, that's nothing compared to what people were saying or seeing. Uh, the Tennessee River tapping is nothing compared to a sea in its full rage. And then Peter's unusual request was to get down there in the middle of it. So that, that, that's pretty, that's trust that I don't know that I possess. Was he wanting to drown? No. Was he, was he wanting to be hurt? No. 
He was wanting to be trusting Christ like he never had before. You know, and that was at the expense of his flesh. You know why separation is important? It's at the expense of your flesh. Because you don't get to do what you want to do. Um, you know, uh, 27 years of ministry, I'm, preach I'm still preaching what men are to wear and what women are to wear. And, you know, well, it's different. You know, I've heard that argument come about sick of it. If I came in here in a skirt, y'all better, be better be ready to throw me out. So what's the difference? Right? Uh, I, I've, nobody's ever been able to answer that for me. The, well, they're cut different. Oh, come on. A pair of breeches is a pair of breeches, right? And, and, and so we see, we see then, as the Lord's people, that, uh, that he was deliberately putting himself in danger to experience something for Christ from Christ that no one else had ever experienced thereunto. And that wasn't a bad thing, that was a good thing. Now, in uh, verse 16, excuse me, uh, uh, verse uh, 16, get to it in a minute. my place. Let me, 14, 28. I'm sorry. Now let's go to verse 29. And he said, come. Now, uh, uh, he made this request and Jesus says, yeah, you can do it. And then, and when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Now, the biggest thing that would interfere with your uh, getting to where Peter was is your fear. Fear will bring you down to nothing in your service to Christ. You know, uh, uh, last year we had some pretty severe weather, and uh, the year before that was even worse. And uh, I preach time and time again, who's the author of the wind? You know what, if the tornado's out there, God put it that way. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you'd enjoy a tornado, but all I can tell you is it's, uh, God put it there, so it's a reason for our purpose, it's a purpose for us somewhere in that. And, and so we find that when he got out, he began to look around. We see the biggest problem was taking his eyes off Jesus. You know what your biggest problem is when you get out there and you get in trouble? is when you take your eyes off Jesus. When, when you are no longer focused on Him and His divine will, we must keep focused in the day which we live. And uh, it's a very difficult, difficult thing to do because of where we abide most of the time spiritually. Verse 31, and immediately, uh, we'll read the, verse of the rest of verse 30, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink, and he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately just Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said, O oh, thou of little faith, whereof didst thou doubt? Now, I want you to see two things, what he uh, said. O oh, thou of little faith. Faith. He didn't say no faith, but he did it one time. Y'all remember when he told Peter that? He said, because you had no faith. Right. He said, why? And it was Peter speaking then too. Why could we not cast him out? He said, because you had no faith. Mm -hmm. You have no confidence. You know, it is very difficult to believe that the demons... The devils of this world are Christ as much supreme over them, and we call his name not that they have to flee. In fact, the Bible is very clear, I think it's in Peter's book, he says, resist the devil and they will flee from you. He will flee from you. Now, if we can resist Satan 
and that happened, why could we not resist his little imps? Because they ain't nothing like him. And, and, and so we find that that is where we ought to be most of the time. <laughs> and he, he says, you have little faith, you, don't, you, you have some. And then he asks him a question, a question that we should ask ourselves, wherefore didst thou doubt? He wasn't saying, did you doubt? He knew he doubted. He said, why did you doubt? Now, I believe I know the answer, and I believe Peter could say so too. It was the storm. It was the storm. He took his focus off Christ, and he saw the big waves and the boisterous wind. He could feel it blowing on him. And it's no use. But you go get your mind off Christ. Go get your focus off Christ. I do way too much. And you know what I have found? Just like Peter, when things begin to happen that way, I begin to see. We need to know where our faith is at. Where does it stand? Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. Matthew 16 and uh, verse 15 uh, Paul is talking to his apostles and he had sent the others away. Excuse me. Jesus is speaking to his apostles and he had sent the others away. And he saith unto them, But whom do ye say that I am? And I want you to ask that question for yourself because the only person I can ask is me. And if I want a sincere answer, I can't answer for Jared, and I can't even answer for my wife after 33 years of marriage. I think I know, but I can't say for sure. I, I, I don't know that. I, but I can't answer for myself. Who do you say Christ is? Who do you believe He is? Hmm? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Man, that's a revealed truth. That, that's not something you get up here. Mm -hmm. That's something you get right here. That, that, that's an amazing, glorious truth that comes only through a spiritual realm. And, 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 and he understood that. And he said, Thou art the Christ. I don't know if this was his revealing time or if he was remembering from previous days. I don't know. I think probably he was saved right here. And, and, and so we find that he makes this bold statement outside Jewish understanding, outside man's understanding, and say, you are the very Son of God. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. Uh, and again, I want you to see the difference in the name. For flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You can't, you can't get that kind of stuff from asking someone to repeat a prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can't get that kind of dedication and understanding and spiritual truth from just going through some kind of little mini mix prayer that, that really is no more whatsoever than what the Catholics do in their vain repetitions. Right. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give thee the keys of the kingdom and of heaven. And whosoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, a lot of people, the Catholics, start doing cartwheels right here. But you know what? Uh, he was given that power to the church. Yeah. And you know what? There's nothing more serious, and the older I get, the more serious I take it, than a church disciplining somebody. That's a very, very yes. uh, careful decision to be made. 
Uh, and, and so we find that he wasn't promoting Peter's Catholic priest, but rather uh, he was endowing the church, and Peter would be their pastor of, of about two years down the road, a year and a half down the road, and he was reminding them. And so we find that Peter has a revealed truth that many people never come to. Matthew chapter uh, 17. Uh, Matthew 17, in the uh, very first verse, the Bible says this, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, uh, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elisha, talking with him. And... And, and then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Now, I want you to see, after having that great truth, just days before, you are the Christ. He's totally off track. I've been there, done that, and she beginning to equate Christ instead of, instead of the very living God in the flesh. He eats him up with prophets. And he, you know the rest of this. <laughs> Said so that he looked around and he saw no man said Christ. And that is where we need to be. Our focus should be on Christ. Uh, now, don't get down on Peter. Because see, I've done the same thing. Time and time. Have you ever been this close to the Lord and the next day be like this? Mm. I know I have. And, and, and so we find the experience that Peter has is no different than every other person, every other man, mankind, uh, our sisters in Christ included. We've all experienced this, the failing to understand the will of God and the presentation of God and how he's presented to you on this occasion. We miss it miserably many, many times. So don't get down on Peter. Be careful of yourself and watch yourself and look at what you're doing because many, many times we are literally in the same shape as Peter was. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. In verse 33. Matthew 26 and 33. The Bible says this, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Don't brag your flesh. And I'll go even further. Don't even brag on the inward man. Christ saved him, but, but we have this to deal with. We have this to deal with. And we will until one day we're finally relieved of the mess that we're in. And so he makes this bold statement. And you know what? I think Peter believed it. I think Peter was sincere when he stated it. But the problem is he was trusting in his flesh. You know what? And these preacher boys, all three of you, I hope you know what I mean. When you get up and you and you haven't found the mind of God and you just preach because you're preaching and you fall flat on your face. And if you haven't experienced it, boy, you will. And that was Peter's condition. Uh, he... He thought he was in the will of God, but he wasn't. And, and, and so we find that uh, that will happen to us time and time again. Uh, through our lifetime serving Christ, we will make these bold brags that really probably we can't keep up with. And Jesus said unto him, verse 34, And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee that thou this night before the cock crow shalt deny me thrice. And he did. Now, I don't think that was the sovereign God speaking right now and saying and, and setting into motion his denial. He already knew it. Hmm. He knew what Peter was made out of. 
It wasn't just that he knew he was going to be denied. He knew Peter's character. What was Peter's problem? It was his flesh. We already seen the revealed truth that he understood who Christ was. So why did he do this? His flesh. Why do we say stupid things? Very same reason. Why do we make promises we can't keep? That's the very same reason. Why do we get in the pool, pool filled, full filled with self righteousness? The very same reason. Yes. And so we find that that Peter uh, once again goes from a tightness with Christ to falling on his seat, uh, his face from seeing him magnified in all his glory to nothing in a matter of days. And that is us time and time and time again throughout our life. Now go with Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And we're going to read uh, just verse 13 for time's sake. Acts chapter 1 and verse 13, the Bible says this. And when they were come in, they went in an upper room where both, both Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zoltalus, and Judas, the brother of James. Now, uh, why does this seem uh, what seemed very insignificant? But let me say this, there's nothing in the Word of God that's insignificant. Not even the genealogies. Uh, but, you know what the issue was? They were hiding. They were in the upper room. That'd be just like us all. I don't know that I could fit through it anymore, but there's a little hole right over there in this little Sunday school room that goes up to the attic. And it's hot up there, and because of the rafters, there's not much of a place to stay in. But that's the kind of place they were in. Can you imagine being so out of the will of God to prefer that over this? Oh, I'd never do that. Oh, don't you tell me that. You see what I'm saying? Uh, so devastated by the events that they were hiding it. That they, they, they were crippled by their fear. Now, we, we, we find that very quickly he begins to gain uh, confidence in the things of the Lord. He begins to uh, gain confidence with what the Lord had left him to do. Acts chapter 3 in the very first verse. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, uh, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which was called Beautiful, to, the, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked of alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took, and he took him by the hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now that's a total turnaround. Did, how did this happen? Now, we know that God did it, right? Only He could work such a miracle. But can you believe the confidence that Peter had unto Christ to say, okay, stand up. Them legs down there gnarled and twisted together and uh, no bump, what we call bone density, density in health care. Y'all remember Anna, our adopted daughter, uh, they showed me and Donna x-rays and you could read through her bones. Just uh, no density at all. And he said, you come on, rise up. Can you imagine the power of God 
to speak to someone like Joey and he walk out of here just as clear minded as me and you. What different God do we serve? None. That's some pretty confidence in the ability of God, isn't it? Uh, it's confidence in faith that I don't know that anybody has in the modern day. And we find that Peter went from uh, the very one that says, uh, yeah, I'll serve you forever, and then sells him out in, in, in one instance. I don't even know the man. The last time, the best I understand the scriptures, the last time he put a little person in there so he could deny even more who he was. And now he has so much confidence in the person of Christ, he takes that crippled man and says, you stand up. You, 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 and then he goes in there and runs about the temple like a Pentecostal man and leaping and praising. <clears throat> That's the God that Peter had began to understand and know. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 9, the Bible, the Bible says, On the morrow as they went up their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up and to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, which is our about noon. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein was all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, the wild beasts, the creeping things, the fowls of the air. And there was a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten of anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, thou call not common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received back up into heaven. Now this is the beginning of the Gentile ministry. This was the beginning when Peter began to understand and know that it was okay to present the lovely gospel of Jesus to people like you and I that have no Jewish heritage whatsoever. And he came, and he came, now that servant said, my master is calling me, won't you come over? And they did. He preached the gospel to that place. People were saved, and he baptized them. You know what? What a wonderful thing. He went from being so self-righteous to the humble little Gentiles, baptizing them and leaving there in glorious and glorious and wonderful thing. And so we find uh, time and time again that Peter became... Uh, who he wanted to be because of faith. Acts 15, verse 7 is the last place I want to read. Acts 15, verse 7. The Bible says this, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. I want to read verse 7 as well. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know not that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth shall hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, if you know your Bible, that's the end of Peter's ministry. Best we know, now, he sent the letters, and we have them to enjoy, but we never hear Peter spoken of again, uh, except when it's a recording of a rebuke. It doesn't even have Peter there. That's a recording of a rebuke that Paul did of Peter, mm -hmm. but never seen him again. You ever thought how you're going to be remembered? How people are going to think of you? Uh, when I'm dead and gone, and where another, my children have, my grandchildren have grandchildren, I will need hardly be remembered. Name on the page, right? Would to God that they would remember me just simply that the Lord had saved me. 
and I was something different because of it. Um, where are you at this morning? Are you uh, like Peter was in Matthew 16? Or are you like Peter was in Matthew 26? It's a very important question, don't you think? Because if you know where you're at, number one, if you, you're in good shape, like Matthew 16, you can uh, be used greatly of the Lord. And if you're in Matthew 26 and you're dying, I don't even know the man. It's good news because you can get help. Peter recovered, didn't he? Peter became a very, very useful vessel. Pastored to Jerusalem at the church of Jerusalem for a number of years. Ended up giving his life for it according to history. We don't have this to tell us that, but according to history, his only request at his death was that he uh, be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to die like Christ was. That's a, that's a big turnaround, isn't it? So what do you ask this morning? Are you in the perfect will of God doing exactly what he would have you to do? It's a very, a very hard thought to even think about, isn't it? Much less answer truthfully. 